Oi. Well, Egon von Gryatz, welcome. Thank you very uh, much. You were actually the second person that we ever interviewed. Well, interview. We did a V questions with you, uh, and you were the, our second guest on Real Vision two and a bit years ago. Yes, I'm happy to be, have been part of that start because you know, what you've achieved is clearly remarkable and very well, exciting. That's very kind, thank you. Yeah. I, I wasn't fishing, I promise, but it's, it's good <laughs> that we actually get a chance to sit and chat because you yeah. and I have chatted over the years and I, I always enjoy those conversations so much. So, so I'm, I'm delighted that other people are going to get, get a chance to eavesdrop on one of these. You know, your background is fascinating to me because everyone knows you as a gold guy uh, and yet your background couldn't have been more different. Perhaps you could just walk people through your career because it really is. Yes, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's, a, yes, it is a bit, it is interesting. Not to you, so, possibly, but <laughs> I'm sure you, everyone no, else will find it, it like it I did. Was, um, so I was born in Sweden, actually, so I have a Swedish passport. I was educated there. The family is a very old Swiss family, and the name, Greer, is Gr same as Gruyere, like the cheese. And, ah, and, and an old, a small village and the castle in, in, in Switzerland. You should visit it one day, it's beautiful. I will. Um, I started my working life in Switzerland as a banker. And then uh, one of our clients called Dixon's, which was a relatively small retail company in 1972, offered me a job in the UK. That's the way. Okay. So I came here and we, during my period there, I was first finance director and then vice chairman. And 17 years we built it from a small photographic retailer to the biggest electronic retailer in the UK, FTSE yeah. 100 company. So it was great fun, actually. I'm sure. Um, to be part of that. And then. I decided I've done my bit in corporate life, so I went back to the investment side, and uh, eventually that led to the creation of Matter on Asset Management, which was, was first a private company, and then we, we made it into, opened it up for outside investors also, because there were a lot of people who wanted to get into gold the way that we were investing in gold, which is physical gold outside the banking system, you know, directly on for yeah. wealth preservation purposes. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm having great fa fun, and, uh, you know, and, and also, have strong views about the world, as you know. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is what you and I talk about, yeah. which is which is why I'm so thrilled to get the chance to do this on camera. Well, just the, the start of Matterhorn, was it a gold-specific vehicle originally? And if so, what, what was it that actually brought you to want to be a gold investor? No, in, initially, we, we ha I had the, the group of friends. It was, it's my company. We invested in various things and took stakes and, and you know, a couple of old companies that also I was involved in selling and floating off like just before the, for example, the internet bubble burst in 2000. You know, I was involved in a company that, that we sold at a good price because I saw it coming. My whole life, I would say that I always looked at risks and always looked at the downside in my corporate life and, and then my investment life. So I always want to understand the downside. You know, the upside is easy. And of course, I saw already in the early 90s, I saw the risks of buildup of debt uh, and of derivatives. Uh, government deficits, etc. So uh, I, I always wanted to see that uh, we protected the investors against the downside. Uh, and then in 2002, we started going into gold. And that was physical gold outside the banking system, as I said, uh, for mainly for our then group of investors. And then eventually uh, I also created the division Gold Switzerland, which is just part of Matter on Asset Management, that deals exclusively in physical gold. And, and we have now clients around the world uh, in that area. Was there an event or something you read, something that kind of took you? Because, it, you know, you, you, the people we've met over the years, it, it's a leap. It's a leap for people to, to get the goal idea. Some people get it instantly, but there's always a catalyst. There's always, they read something or they hear something and it makes them start thinking about things. Was there a moment like that for you? No, I think it was a gradual process. I, I, I saw the risks, I saw the problems. I didn't come from the conventional investment industry. Uh, I wasn't an asset manager as such, uh, or I wasn't a banker who obviously no banker ever buys gold right. for their clients because they don't understand it uh, and they can't make any money on gold. So therefore, they want to churn commission, as we know. Uh, so therefore, to me, it was very clear that you had to, uh, to protect against the risks I saw. Um, you, gold is not an investment, it's just it's an insurance um, a, and it is a wealth protection asset. Uh, and, and therefore the best protection was gold and then we started for ourselves. We went into gold at $300. Then there was demand uh, from, from other people and, and then we became regulated in Switzerland and, and established ourselves there as a Swiss company before it was an offshore company. Yeah. Um, and and um, so you know, it was always, there is no other investment in my view that protects against the risks and the potential 
catastrophes that I see in the world, uh, no better investment than gold uh, to do that. You talk to more people than I do about this stuff, uh, and I'm sure you get the same kind of pushbacks that I do. When people talk to you about gold, who, who have come to you to find out more about it, and, and they've got the usual pushbacks about, you know, you don't earn anything, and it's volatile, and all these things. Yeah. How do you kind of yeah. How do you how do you talk to them about it? Because I think it'd be interesting for people to hear. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, one of the most, very common things for people who don't like gold is you can't eat gold. Right, right. But you know, who the hell eats paper money? Well, you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't you taste. You can swallow it. No, <laughs> but in every period uh, of panic or trouble in the world, gold has always been money, and gold has always helped people out. Whether you take, you know, whether you take, you know, obviously examples like hyperinflation, examples like the Weimar Republic, but even even the Asians who came out of Africa, take they're like out of Uganda, they're pushed out by Idi Amin. They couldn't take out any money, but they all they hadn't didn't dare to have money anyway in the, in the financial system. But they came out, they came out with gold. Yeah, they came out with gold and jewelry. They came to the UK, bought businesses, and, and started again. So. You know, and the Indians know this, the uh, Chinese know it, the West doesn't understand it uh, because we've been indoctrinated now with uh, paper money uh, and of course now, as you know, paper money is also disappearing Yeah. because every government is now finding ways of banning it because they haven't got any. That's, that's the main reason, the two reasons. Why they, they haven't got enough money, you know, if there's a bank run, we know there's not enough money in the bank because they're leveraged 20 to 50 times. Um, and secondly, of course, now we have this uh, big brother is watching around the world that every government wants to control the people now, so they pay their taxes. The two things is that there isn't the money in the banking system because it's bust, uh, and the other thing is I said that you know everybody should now pay the, but nobody should get away from from taxes, uh, which is fair enough. But uh, uh, I'm libertarian, so I think that that you know, ta taxes should be shouldn't shouldn't be at the level they are today. Well, you know, when, you, when you look at that stuff, it's, um, it's interesting to see how this plays out. There's been two stories this week that, that I, I saw that I found fascinating. The first one was that uh, the Greeks are thinking about putting a tax on ATM withdrawals. Yeah. <clears throat> which I found extraordinary. After yeah. all the lengths they've gone to try and get people to put money in the banks so yeah. that they know where it was. Yeah. I mean, who's going to put your money in the bank there that you've already paid tax on to pay another tax to take it out? It's ludicrous. And the second one was a piece uh, in the Australian newspaper after the events we saw in India, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about shortly. Yeah. And this, uh, they were talking about getting rid of the $100 bill in Australia. Mm. And the headline was, let's do away with the jolly green giant. Yeah. And you know, it's just the language around making these things palatable and acceptable. Um, I mean, then they have a strong tailwind with millennials that all they care about is being able to wave their card and not have to carry cash around. You know, this this ban on cash is is very real. It's happening right now, mm. and it's going to get way more severe than people think. I suppose. What, what do you think about that? I hate it uh, because you're taking away freedom from people. You know, the paper money is not real. Of course, we know that paper money has zero value. Is it, this intrinsic value is zero, as, as Voltaire said? Uh, and it always, throughout history, paper money has always become worthless uh, at the end of any era, basically. Or, or before that, the, you know, the Roman coin also went from 100% mm. from silver almost to 0% silver. Uh, so, so uh, you know, th this is a way for governments now, first of all, yes, so, so they can print the paper money, but not even that now uh, is possible anymore because they would have to print so much and there isn't enough money in the system. So the next thing is now the electronic money. You know, I'm. So I'm Swedish and Swiss, but the, the, the Swiss side in me <laughs> prevails when it comes to cash. <laughs> and, and actually, at Switzerland, um, people still like paying by cash and having cash in their wallet when they go to a restaurant, when they go to pay by cash. Um, it's the same in Germany. You, so it's something like 86% of transactions yeah. in Germany are done through cash. And it's not because it's black money or, no. or untaxed money. It's just like, because it's the only real money there is. The rest is just an entry on a computer in a bank. Uh, and that money isn't there. At least you know when you have the cash that it is as real as it can be, yeah. you know, except for gold, which is more real money. But, but um, paper money you know, is a way of transacting. Uh, but in Switzerland, we still have the thousand franc Banknote, 
thousand francs is like thousand dollars a yeah. day. You know that's totally acceptable. And you can and you can is still in Switzerland take out any amount. Although banks often limited to to a uh, hundred thousand at the time, hundred thousand dollars. Go to any other bank in Forget it. Europe Forget it. or in the world and try to take out hundred thousand. But uh, what's interesting is when you think about all the fuss that's been made of the five hundred euro note. Yeah. No one's. No one's talking about the hundred, uh, the thousand Swiss franc note. No, and, and I understand that the, the, the circulation is much smaller. Yes, but still, I mean, this is not Switzerland doesn't have the problems that Europe has. No, simply put. No, um, you know, I lived in many countries. The political system in Switzerland I find better than any other country, uh, and you know they, you know, just look at if we jump to how they manage their economy. When I started working in Switzerland in banking in 1969, one dollar was four Swiss francs thirty. Today, one dollar is one to one, one dollar one Swiss franc. So you, you've gone down by seventy-five percent, basically, uh, and that is just the result of a well-managed economy. We talk about today the strong dollar, but still, the strong dollar has still gone down 75% against the Swiss franc in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, so, you know, the Swiss understand how to manage the economy. They understand that, you know, the, the, the freedom and independence of people is so important in Switzerland. People hate being meddled with in Switzerland. This is why you have these... Uh, uh, petitions. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, the private referenda. Uh, um, uh, you know, where anyone with the list of 100,000 signatures can actually raise any issue. Yeah. You remember we talked when it was we did that on the on the gold uh, yeah. uh, initiative, uh, which failed because this was to make gold a more important part of the of the, of the Swiss uh, monetary system. But of course, the the powers that be that were influenced from the U.S. and from the, actually the head of the national bank uh, at the time. I mean, he's a he's a banker and a hedge fund guy. It, it sadly changed. Even Switzerland has changed. I mean, it, it's become much more, uh, much too dominated by by the Fed and everybody else. So, cash, I think, is very important. It's important for the for the freedom of the people uh, and actually to spend their own money. But that's not allowed anymore. Uh, uh, and this is why uh, gold, of course, is not spendable today. It will be in the crisis. Uh, uh, but but today uh, you can't you can't use it to go to the shop and spend it. But certainly, gold is at least real money. It has a value. Well, there's a couple of things there that I, that I want to go back to, uh, and, and the, the, the first of them is the Swiss, the management economy, and specifically the Swiss National Bank. Uh, and then I want to get back to the, the referendum, because I, I want to talk to you about that, because yeah. you know, people might not be familiar with it, and no one has a better insight into what, what happened than you. But just going back to the Swiss National Bank, um, you know, the last few years, they've done some extraordinary things, extraordinary from a historical concept of how they are perceived. For example, the you know the peg to the euro, which I think everybody understood when they did that that it was unsustainable, completely unsustainable. But they spent sixty billion Swiss francs of taxpayers' money defending that peg and then walking away from it. Hmm. And latterly, the uh, actually well uh, yeah that's that's the loss, but they've actually spent six hundred right, billion. No, no absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean that was the cost yeah, of the taxpayer. The cost, yeah. Uh, and latterly. The creation of money out of thin air to buy Apple shares of all things. Yeah. You know, these are very un-Swiss principles, very, very uncharacteristic things for the for the Swiss National Bank to do. What do you sense the strains are that are forcing them to do that? It, it saddens me uh, that this is happening. I must say, because uh, you know, Switzerland and Swiss banks used to be extremely conservative. Mm. But then gradually there was this pressure on performance and, and, and leverage and coming from obviously the, um, the, the West and the US especially. And the banks, big, uh, Swiss banks, the big ones, UBS and Credit Suisse, became like any other international investment bank uh, and started speculating and leveraging, etc. So that they're not, I mean, now, you know, the Swiss banking system is now seven times Swiss GDP. That's the biggest in the Western world, as big as Cyprus, you know, which collapsed. And that's we're very unhealthy. So that's, even though I say that the political system in Switzerland is better than anywhere else, the banking system, I don't trust the banking system. I don't trust any banking system for that matter. But even Switzerland, because it's too big for the country. You know, if, if seven times GDP, if something happens there, 
uh, then they need to print an awful lot of money if something happens to the big bank. So, and it's the same, as you said, with the Swiss National Bank. The Swiss National Bank has a balance sheet which is now greater than GDP. That's just unbelievable. Remember that the, the Fed's balance sheet is, what, 25% of GDP? Yes, yeah, they're at 4 trillion, and yeah, yeah, so GDP is 14-ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Japan is now, of course, also getting to that. It's actually now higher than the US balance sheet also. This is where you see a change in the leadership and the thinking of the Swiss National Bank. Before, they were conservative people. Strong Swiss, Swiss francs equals a strong economy. I mean, that's always been the principle throughout history. A strong currency is always the same as a strong economy. I went from the U from Switzerland to UK in 72. It was one pound 10 Swiss francs. Today is one. Yeah. You know, so it's been massive inflation. We're in the UK today. Uh, massive inflation here in Switzerland has had very little inflation. So what I'm saying is a strong currency actually means low inflation. And Switzerland has managed by having no deficits virtually, um, relatively low debt, and therefore keep inflation low and keep the economy strong. Now there's a different type of people running the Swiss National Bank, and these are the bankers, influenced by, as I said, the Fed and the Western Central Banks. So they are the money printers now, which is totally wrong because Switzerland, for, for as I said, decades, if not longer, has actually prospered by having a strong currency. And now they believe that the currency must be weak. It must be as weak as the most rubbish currency in Europe, or one of them, they're all bad, uh, right. which is the euro. Um, so they're trying to keep it down um, at, at the level of the euro. And as you said, you know, they, they was pegged, pegged at 120. And then I wrote articles and I wrote a fun letter uh, you know, for, as the chairman of the, of the Swiss National Bank to the, to the board saying, I'm extremely nervous yes. about what's going to happen to the peg. And I think it's going to collapse and all of that. Uh, and this is our biggest risk. And it happened. You know, uh, 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 a few weeks after the gold initiative was lost, they, it was, the, it was, yeah, it was, a few, it was literally yeah, a few weeks. weeks. Yeah, it was yeah. in the, the, the golden issue. It was the uh, end of uh, last of November 2014. Yeah, it was January. Uh, and it was 15th of January, yeah. I think it was, yeah. uh, the, the peg one. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think that had those times been reversed, the initiative would have gone through? Had, had that peg collapsed beforehand, do you think uh, it would have gone through? I'm not sure, you know, it, it's so hypothetical, it's hard to say. No, because, but it felt yeah. kind of close. It felt closer yes, than perhaps it yeah, should have been. Let's say the central bank that were and the politicians, I mean, they were out every day with propaganda yeah. in order to win this initiative, which is really against... It's illegal, essentially. Well, yeah. no, maybe not legal, but it's certainly... That is not, it's not done. Government yeah. shouldn't actually campaign for a private uh, initiative or against a private initiative. So, but they were in the press every day saying how bad it would be. You would lose all your jobs. Uh, it would be, become, you know, the, the cantors will lose all their, their money because they get income from the Swiss National Bank, et cetera, et cetera. All they say, said was wrong. Everything. They lied through the but, but it's interesting because that, that was exactly what happened with Brexit. You know, all, mm. all the predictions beforehand. Yes proved completely false. And I just wonder now that, that Brexit has been demonstrably proved so far to not be instantly catastrophic, as was widely touted. Yes. The, the Swiss thing has proven to be completely wrong. Mm. It's just interesting if that referendum were actually to come up again, it would be a fascinating test of how the world's changed to see how that would go. Yes. Uh I've learned one thing in life, you know, yeah, it you doesn't go no, back. No do over. So, <laughs> it no, I, go back. I, totally, so, I totally get that. So, you know, it's, it's, we it's, just it's, get no, on no, with no. it. But, you know, but you're right. It's the same with Brexit. I mean, I was, since we're in the UK now, and, and I have, you know, strong ties with the UK, having lived here a long time, I was absolutely for Brexit. I have three sons-in-law, two work in the city, and, of course, they have a vested interest uh, because for them, short term, it was better, they, they believed anyway to stay uh, within the EU, like, like most of the elite in London did, uh, and, and whilst in the country people have different views. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm not, you know, the, the reason why I believe in Brexit was just the, uh, I said it again, I'm, I'm, I'm a libertarian, I believe in, in, in actually people managing their own affairs. I don't believe in an in a unelected, unaccountable elite sitting in Brussels deciding over 500 million people. That's why I'm against it. It has freedom, you know, and I see in Switzerland small units where it goes down. Most of the decision making is in the canton, uh, which is in the regions, in the states, local states, rather than the federal uh, government, which has relatively little power and gets very little of the whole of the tax income. And that's why Brexit, 
that's the first sign of what's happening with the mood of the people. What all the politicians, all the elite misread, and the papers are just, you know, they have no in, uh, independent analysis whatsoever. Uh, everybody writes the same. So there was just like with the Swiss private initiative, everybody is for the system, for the mm -hmm. elite. So, uh, and of course, Brexit was the first. I mean, the EU will break up. There's only a question of when, in my view. It's an artificial organization uh, uh, which should not exist, and, and nor should the Euro. Euro. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting, Simon Mikhailovich, who I, who I know you know, yes. um, pointed an article out to me some months ago now, um, which I kind of read and thought, this is interesting, and I've been following the story. And then last week, Credit Suisse announced that they were going to essentially ring fence their domestic bank, the, the, sort of the Swiss retail bank, and the wealth management yeah. arm is going to be essentially yeah. spun out. Yeah. Um, and the risky trading operation is going to be included. And so the Swiss are already preparing good bank, bad bank. And, yeah. I, and I'm pretty sure, as goes Credit Suisse, so will go UBS yes, and, and others. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it, it's interesting that they seem to be preparing for something. It, yeah. it looks like a lifeboat to me, should they need it. And that's not to say it's imminent, but they're clearly thinking ahead to just the sort of thing you, you, you propose might happen with Europe. Yes, no, they know the risks and they know, um, but their biggest risk is again, of course, uh, or one of the biggest risks is Swiss National Bank's balance sheet. Mm. Uh, because uh, if, if that currency breaks again now, uh, and the Swiss French franc strengthens again, which is not unlikely, it's because of the, as I said, because of the problems with the Swiss National Bank and, uh, uh, and their balance sheet, you know, the Swiss franc shouldn't be strong either but you know, the euro will be weaker. That's absolutely guaranteed. And therefore the Swiss franc relatively will be strong. So they will have problems again. So the Swiss government sees this, they're not stupid and, and, and uh, they're probably more sensible than most governments because it's always been a, a coalition. It's always been consensus rule. And therefore they, they have always, you know, they always take sensible decisions. So yes, they're seeing it. Um, and you know, I, the, the, everything lasts longer than you think, because when you see yeah. something, you think it's going to happen quickly. But, and that includes the, the EU and the Europe. So let's get back to the gold market. Um, you know, it's been a roller coaster year. We've seen you know, eight months of crazy buying, uh, the, the kind of buying that we haven't seen for sort of four years. Mm. Uh, and then it, it kind of seems to turn around, in my mind, for all the wrong reasons. What have you seen from the from the management side? You know, it's interesting. I think our business, uh, when it comes to gold, is very different to most people's because uh, we are, if you want, preaching to the converted. Yeah. Uh, we are concerned about the risks in the world. We're saying that because of these risks, you have to keep part of your capital outside the banking system in a form that actually will have will always have a value it will fluctuate but always have a value and against paper money has always appreciated throughout history because paper money as we said before goes down to zero so um you know the gold peaked initially in 2011 uh and then remained str uh, strong for another year or so and, and started going down properly in uh, early 2013. now Throughout the whole of the downturn in gold, our assets, although we're not holding in our balance sheet because they're the client's assets, not ours, uh, but, but our gold assets have increased, uh, the, the constantly increased. So that means that the investor we have hasn't changed his mind because of the fall in the price mm -hmm. of gold. And of course, then there are new buys coming in. And of course, people love buying when things go up. That there is, you know, buying high and selling low is is, is the uh, the method that most reassuringly yeah. expensive. I think is the, is the phrase. Uh, so you know, when you tell them that you should buy when when it's unloved and undervalued, like we did in two thousand two at three hundred dollars, uh, yeah, some of our investors have done that and believe in that. They they are not worried about the price. We get very very few calls when uh, gold goes down. Uh, and, and virtually no seller. So, so from that point of view, we are unique. We have actually, we are in, in part immune, or our investors are immune to the fluctuations in the gold price. Of course, there will be more buying if it really goes up because then more people will enter that market. So we, obviously we saw a bit more buying, yes, the first six months or even eight months of this year and on the last 
the month or two has been, been more quiet. But as I said, we are not typical. We are not the hedge fund where people go in when it goes up and sell when it goes down. So our business is a much more stable business because our, our, the, our investors do what we believe is right. They keep their gold as insurance against other things in the world. And the thing is, you can't wait to buy your insurance the day before the fire and then get rid of it when you had the fire and then wait until the next one. Uh, so you just have to sit on it and you know over time, if you live long enough, gold will depreciate or paper money will, will, will depreciate. I think everybody watching this who manages gold assets is, is secretly cursing you right now that the phone wasn't ringing when the, when the price goes down because people are so used to nervous, skittish investors in, yeah. in a very, very volatile asset. Yeah. But you know, gold isn't really uh, volatile. You don't buy gold because of events. Gold, as we know, r r maintains a constant value and paper money goes down. And therefore we know it's guaranteed that paper money will continue uh, to depreciate. And therefore gold will always measure that. And so it's, it's that simple. Now, if you want to try to trade every in and out, you're, going to, you're guaranteed to lose, absolutely guaranteed to lose. Uh, and, and our investors don't do that. So therefore, you know, we're lucky that, of course, no one likes when it goes down. And, and now we are at 1185 or 90 today. Yes, of course you can go down to the previous lows again, because when there's no demand uh, and, and now with a t uh, temporarily strong dollar, gold is reflecting that uh, and, and therefore uh, in the paper market it is so easy to push it down to any level in the short term. But in my view, all the fundamentals uh, for gold to go up to you know, much higher uh, levels is still there. It hasn't changed and it will not change. Yeah, it, uh, this is a constant source of bewilderment to me. When you when you have an asset that is an element, I mean, it, it's it's literally an element. It's on the periodic yeah. table, and yet people can't value it for its fundamental properties. I, I find that yeah. really really strange to do because people people don't think of it the way you think of it, and and people do get shaken out by the volatility, and they do get worried when price falls. It, it, it's a rare investor that actually does think of it in the way that you do. Because the world today is all about instant gratification. You know, you, you, you buy something now and you want to make 20% at the yeah. end of the year. You know, everything on, if you buy a property, everything has, it must go up short term. Uh, and everybody trades in and out. And of course, um, in bull markets, everyone is an expert as we know, and, and in bear markets, nobody knows anything. Right. We have to come back to the risks. And that's, you know, this is the reason behind uh, people should hold gold. The risks are that no sovereign state, major sovereign state, will e ever repay the debt. That's guaranteed, right. absolutely guaranteed. Japan will, the Japanese economy will sink into the Pacific. You know, they're, as we know, they're buying all the bonds they're issuing themselves. But, but I mean, look, there, there, is, there is a pushback argument to that, which is essentially these sovereign states don't need to pay back all their debt. There's never going to be a come a point in time where they need to pay it all back. I think the, 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 the problem is the extent to which they've over indebted themselves. It's not, you know, the US doesn't ever have to pay back all its debt, but can it run $19 trillion going to 20 and who knows where? At some point, no, they don't. Well, you see, there is a limited time when you artificially can manipulate the cost of this money you're borrowing, whether it's Japan, or whether it's the US, or whether it's Europe, where rates are between negative and, and you know, a little bit positive, even the you know, long rate in the US, which is higher than in most uh, Western countries, is, is just over 2% now, the, the 10 year, which is too cheap. Sure. For a bankrupt borrower, basically. Uh, uh, and therefore, so if you're saying that they never have to repay it, which is a ridiculous idea, because if you and I borrow from the bank uh, and say we're never going to repay it, you know, they're not going to lend us the money. No, but we, but we don't have the power of taxation and the, and the power of the printing Printing prints. money. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Exactly. Uh, so, all right, let's accept that they can't repay it or they don't have to repay it because... Well, not all of that. I'm not saying that. I'm mean, saying that the, the mindset is, okay, that there, is a, there is a debt amount. I don't put a figure on it. There is an amount that they could carry in perpetuity and fund and people would not really look at that 
as a detriment to their... Yeah, but that's all right if it was stable and if, yes. if you know, they could finance it at 5%, at 10% and at 15%. Right. Remember, you know, I, I, was, I was in the UK in the, in the 70s. Uh, you know, interest rates were for, was, were for many years 15, 17%. Sure. My first mortgage was 21% right. for a limited period. Who could pay that today? You know, which government could afford, you know, take Japan or take the, uh, Europe or take the US, 5% interest even. No, it doesn't work. You're or 10% right. 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 interest. That, you know, one of the big risks in the world is the bond market. Whatever happens to the world economy, the bond market, in my view, they cannot manipulate rates forever, especially not long rates. And that bond market, you look at the curve and you look at where we are now at the 1945 level of all time low uh, in, in bond rates. That bond market, in my view, at some point will collapse. Well, well this is, I mean, I completely agree with you. And there, there's plenty going on right now that would give credence to the argument that maybe if we're not there, we're close. I mean, yeah. do, do you think this is the end of that bull run or do you think this is just some noise before we continue? Because it, it feels to me like the Treasuries haven't gone as far as they can go. When you look at Germany, you look at France, and you yeah. see all these bankrupt countries trading at zero or negative on the 10 year. The US is you know, two and change percent. It's, a, that's it's a interesting. Way. You know, you are right. I, I think probably it's gone too fast now anyway. And I, I could see rates uh, coming off again a little bit now. But the, you know, the central banks will do what they can to manipulate the, the shorter end of the market. I mean, they have more problems manipulating the longer end, although they, they're trying to do that too. So I, I agree with you that the US will need to keep short rates low. But nevertheless, the rates are, the longer trend is rates will reach 5, 10, 15, 20% or more in my view. So, so when you say that, central, that, that governments don't need to repay debt, the problem is they need to service debt. Yes, uh, exactly. Right. And when rates go up to 5 or 10% or more, and I think having lived in the, in the 70s and experienced this, I, I can see it happening again. I mean, I can see it technically happening, and I can see it fundamentally happening, because, so because of, you know, there'll be more money printing everywhere uh, that will continue. And, and in the end, you know, they will not be able to keep rates low. And that means that um, governments will not be able to, they will need to print even more money. Yeah to pay for the interest only. And therefore these high borrowings are, I mean, are, is an unsound policy that will not last and the world can only start to get back to a, a, a real growth path again if that debt implodes. And, and in my view, one day it has to implode. So where, where do you look? When you, when you sit looking around the world for, for sort of signs, because I think we're, that's what we're all doing. At this point, we're all looking for a sign that, okay, this is it because we've been waiting for something to happen since 08, essentially. Yes. Um, we've been waiting for this bond market capitulation, the reversal. What do you look at? What are the signs that you're waiting for? Is there anything specific or is, is it a feeling? Or I do watch you and uh, Raul uh, you know, talking about markets, uh, etc. I mean, I don't look at these short-term indicators is turning now yeah. uh, in, in the same way. So I look at the longer trends and of course there's always a risk with that, you know, as Keynes said that, you know, in the long run we're all dead. <laughs> so you can wait a long time that I was right but it didn't happen. But the catalyst comes out of the blue in my uh, view, you know, that it's something that you don't expect. Because the catalyst is not the reason for a change. The change is all this overhanging debt, uh, uh, in the world. I mean, that's, that is the one problem in the world. Um, the debt that will never be repaid and can never, a, in, soon, can't even pay the interest on it. Um, and that's, that will just break one day. And then, you know, you can use the, the, uh, the avalanche, uh, you know, the last, the last snowflake, snowflake yeah. triggering the avalanche and all that. And th that will happen. But of course, interest rates turning now, the longer, th I think that's important. Trump will, of course, fulfill this prophecy by you know printing more money i mean I, I you know i looked back the u.s since 1981 debt has doubled every eight years which means that they've increased rate on average uh, rates on average since reagan by nine percent a year nine percent a year means doubling every eight years and that's without fail and then there's some fluctuations uh, so precedents are not going to change the trend Trump is not no. going to be able to do more than the mar marginal things. It's all about timing, becoming a president or becoming a leader of a country, nothing else. It's like becoming, you know, running a company. 
If you come in at the bottom, you're bloody lucky. <laughs> exactly if, right. That's exactly right. And if you come in at the top, as Trump has done, you have no chance whatsoever. So he will be, in my view, whatever he does, he'll be hated president at the end of this period because I think the problems are just for, too big for him to do anything about. Reagan came in when, you know, it was easy. It was low debt, uh, it was low, uh, low debt to GDP. There was, you know, the stock markets were low. High interest rates. I mean, you're right. Exactly. He had, he had perfect, it was so easy. Thing. So, you know, the fact that he, the debts went up two and a half times during his reign, nobody worried about because, of course, stock market uh, also went up uh, by, by uh, the yeah. same amount. Um, and so it continued. And, and as I said, you know, but, but Trump will not have that possibility. It's interesting, by the way, that, you know, both stocks, the Dow and debt in the US has grown by exactly 9% a year for, for, since 1981. Uh, so, you know, the stocks are totally just driven by debt, as we know, uh, but more or less by the same percentage uh, average of the time. So I think Trump sadly will fail, not because it's Trump, but only because it's the US economy. There's no chance of doing anything about it. So, so coming back to your trigger, I don't see any specific triggers, but I see him fulfilling uh, what I expect uh, that will be, he will try, he will try, but they, you know, spend more money, lower the tax, etc. So, and it will fail, uh, and therefore uh, deficits will grow even more, and, and debt will probably go grow by more, much more than nine percent a year during yeah. his reign, uh, and and he will be hated, and and also stock market in real terms, whatever happens to, if there will be hyperinflation or not, but but in real terms, stock markets will in my view, collapse in the next four years uh, in real time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a perfect setup for gold, frankly. Yes. Um, and it's, it's interesting that we've kind of had this setup for some time now. And Trump, again, Trump, Trump is many things, but it seems to me that, that he is a catalyst. Whichever, whichever way it goes, I don't know. But just <clears throat> the introduction of change effectively to a closed system mm. and the reintroduction of volatility to a stable yeah. system, yeah. both suggest that he is a significant agent of change. And yes. as bond yields can't change and go much lower, yes. and equities, it's hard to see them changing and going an awful lot higher without growth, yeah. one has to suspect that that change is going to be in the opposite direction. And when you look at gold, something that the environment has been there, the setup has been there, and, and anyone that's owned gold has kind of scratched their head about if, if they are people that fixate on the price, they kind of scratch in their head and say, well, you know, why isn't, why isn't gold going up? And sometimes it just needs that outside influence, whatever it may be. No, you're right. And, and I'm sure Trump will help. I mean, remember, Trump is an entrepreneur and he's quite a, you know, quite a volatile entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs have no principles. Right. You have to remember that, you know. Well, I am one, so let's, I, I take offence to that. <laughs> oh, so am I, in a small way, but, uh, but yes, but that, that's different. You know, uh, he's prog you're not running a country, so you're okay. Uh, not yet. Hey, if Trump can do it, I can do it. What's this place? Yeah. <laughs> well, I will see. You might get a chance, who knows? <laughs> so, you know, we've already seen it. He can change his mind ten times within, within a month on the same issue. Because that's what an entrepreneur does, and he forgets about the failure, goes on to the next thing, and doesn't worry. It's a great point, yeah, it's a really good point. Um, and, and therefore, people will absolutely be exasperated with him in the end, because he will change all the time, change and shifts, and they don't know where they stand. And of course, he's never ever worked with anyone as strong as he is around him either. Yeah. So it'll be impossible for him to, with all these people, and they probably a lot of people will leave because they can't stand working for, for an entrepreneur. It's so different. Um, so, so therefore, I could see uh, you know, real, real trouble in the US. I mean, I wish him well, and I really hope that he'll do well. And I, some of his ideas, you know, because I'm also against the elite, against this establishment that, uh, that, that, that um, Clinton represents. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I think there's too much against him uh, to succeed, and, yeah, and, and including his own mentality. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, but, but what about, let's come back to Europe, uh, and staying on the same topic, because there's an awful lot that's going to happen in Europe in the next year. You know, we've got, we've got the Italian referendum, obviously, which, will, which will, ha will have happened by the time this airs. Yeah. Then very quickly, you know, we have Austrian elections, we have 
Dutch, French, German elections. Yeah. I mean, the, the entire core of Europe yeah. is about to have a vote on Europe, essentially. I mean, it, it might be about the people, but let's face it, all these votes are about Europe. As someone that sits right in the middle of the whole thing, yeah. what's your sense? Is this the year that finally Europe has to make that choice? Or can they kind of put another Band-Aid on this for, and get through these elections somehow? You know that the, the EU elite, I mean, they are doing all they can to keep this artificial union together, uh, ignoring the will of the people and the mood of the mood of the well, people. And the suffering of the people in the, in the southern Mediterranean yeah. states. There are. And, 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 you know, people are suffering. You see the, 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 the migration in some city, you know, go to Paris or, whatever, or go to Germany. Um, it, it is a problem. It is a big problem. I think that's the that's what turned it in the UK. It wasn't my view that you shouldn't have an elite uh, in Brussels running one little state out of 500 million, you know, 65 million people in the UK. What made people here vote for Brexit was, of course, the problems with the migration. Hmm. That was what the people in the countryside thought, because they're seeing it in, in a different way to people in London. Uh, and because it is, you know, proper migration when people come and work for their living is fine. But, you know, like my, my, my uh, old country, Sweden, where they, or like Germany, where they just open the doors, and now there's so many, they can't take care of them. There are, they, they, you know, there aren't schools, there, there, there are not housing, there's not housing, and of course no jobs, and they will never integrate, and you get ghettos. I mean, it's Sweden now, although they don't want to admit it, and they don't write it in the papers, but I think there are at least 55 no-go areas now in Sweden. Mm. You know, a small conservative country with you know, 10 million people, you know, 55 no-go areas. I mean, that never happens. No, sure. You know, which means no-go means that you know, police and uh, has to accompany ambulance or fire uh, uh, departments that are when they come into those areas. It's just unbelievable. So this is happening in Germany in the same way, and of course in, in France and in more and more countries. And I think in the end, the European people who have been indoctrinated by the elite uh, and Merkel has been one of the you know, m main factors behind this. You know, now they're seeing that it's destroying their country, uh, the, the, uh, and the European people, I think, will protest. As always, these processes take a lot longer than you think. They don't happen overnight. We, you know, we, when, as I said before, when we see something we think is, <laughs> needs to happen quickly, but it doesn't. You know, so whether all the countries will throw out the EU, or I mean, whether whether now Beppe, Beppe Grillo will, will win in Italy, and Le Pen in France, etc. If it's this time or not, but the trend will be very clear in my view. The trend has changed now. The mood of the people is now swinging this, uh, and, and the migration will play a major role in that, sadly. Yeah, I, I struggle to see. I mean, I've, I've thought Europe was going to fall. It was inevitable it would fall apart. Yeah. But they've managed to keep it together for a couple of years longer than I thought they would. And so, you know, I, but I guess just as I'm starting to doubt betting against them, it's probably the time to double down because the strains on that system are enormous now. Yeah. You spend your time between the UK and and Switzerland, uh, and we've talked about the Swiss banking system. What's it been like in the UK since Brexit? From someone on the ground that kind of saw the lead up, has seen the vote, and and was kind of perhaps waiting for the sky yes. to fall in the day after. How's the feel yeah. in the UK since yeah. Brexit? Yes, and I mean, again, come back to my my family, my sons-in-law, who are all you know shocked about the result, like everybody was, especially that they're so shocked. And now all of a sudden, as you know, we all know, you know, things go on, okay, the pound took a hit. Uh, nobody minds that, they think it's good for the economy. Uh, stock market has been good, housing market has been okay. Um, and uh, the economy is still optimistic. I mean, the UK has got the same problems and the same debts and the same deficits and the same uh, current account deficits as, as a lot of countries. Uh, but nevertheless, but the mood is very good here. That, that, yeah. um, except the, the only problem here is that 50%, of course, are, are, are against Brexit. And they're still, you know, Tony Blair is coming back, which is unbelievable. Oh, don't, uh, don't get me started. He should uh, have been thrown out long ago just because of what he did in Iraq and, and etc. Um, 
but he's still trying to come back and, and create a role for himself and, and uh, saying that this is a disaster. It isn't a disaster. Actually, there's nothing like free trade in my view, and I think people are starting to, to realize that, and a lot of companies in, in the UK are saying that too. Rather than having somebody in Brussels deciding over every country and, and negotiating for everyone, you do your own deals. You can do a lot better deals than if, if somebody at a distance uh, negotiates for you. Germany needs the UK more than UK needs Germany. We all, we know that. This hard Brexit now and the um, fact that the EU is not going to accept it, the elites are saying no, they're not going to accept it. At the end of the day is the German workers and the German companies and management who decide. Because if, if they don't actually get, if they're not going to be able to sell cars to the UK, they will throw out the government. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it'll be pragmatic, even with the EU, in my view. And for the rest of the world, it's fantastic. You can actually do individual tr trade deals without having uh, this massive organization in Europe uh, doing it for you. Uh, bureaucratic and, uh, and, and totally uh, uh, uncommercial. So I think the, for the UK, I would be very optimistic. I mean, they'll the same problems here as I just said, in that like in every other country, the UK will suffer. But I think long term, this is absolutely the right thing for the UK uh, and for many European countries. So we, we started on gold and I, and I want to finish on gold. And I just want to get some thoughts from you on the, the outlook for the next year for gold. Because we've had this, this same dynamic, we've, we've spoken about it already in, the, in this conversation, the setup. The, the, the demand for gold out of Asia, physical gold, we can see the, the, the volume of gold being shipped through the Shanghai Exchange, for example, is, yeah. is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I don't think yeah. anyone would have forecast it would be this big. Yeah. You're, in, you're in the business of physical gold. What are you seeing in terms of movements around the world and how do you see that shaping up in 2017? It's so interesting. You know, we have uh, four major refiners in Switzerland who, who, who actually uh, refine most of, of the gold in the world. And they are constantly busy. I mean, they have periods when they have to work a bit extra. I mean, they're, all, all the refiners are running 24 hours you know, all the time. And, you know, there is, as we know, I mean, there is today a bit under 3,000 tons of, of production, you know, between 2,500 and, and 3,000 of mine production, and then there's the scrap gold on top of that. And, you know, all of that is being sold every day, basically. That, you know, there's no, there's no piles of, of yeah. gold anywhere. There's no stocks of gold. Everything is actually being absorbed by the market. So, so you know, to, and we know there isn't more gold. So, so what, you know, I am absolutely convinced that we will have the money printing, um, the destruction of the paper currencies, uh, and therefore gold will reflect that in the next few years, exactly. And then on top of that, we have the technical side, uh, which is the, the COMEX and the futures gold, etc., that you know, is a fraction of, 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 of the physical gold. Oh, sorry, physical gold is a fraction of, of, of their commitments, and therefore uh, there's no chance when the paper gold holders ask for delivery, there will not be any gold. So all of that will push gold up. And of course, there is no more gold available. And of course, production is constantly going down. So in 2025, it'll go, it'll be from 3,000 to 2,000 tons produced. So, so actually, you know, uh, the availability of gold is going down and the demand will go up. And we will get to a point when inflation uh, goes up, in my view, then when all institutions will have to own gold for, for inflation protection. So now they own less than half a percent of their assets mm -hmm. in gold. But if they go up to one and a half percent, you know, if an institution is going to spend uh, a, a billion dollars uh, on gold at, at today's price, but tomorrow he won't get $1,200 uh, gold, he might have to pay uh, $12,000 instead. He will still spend a billion dollars or a billion pounds, but he'll get a tenth of, of, of what he would yeah. have got. And that's what's going to happen. So there are points when you see very clear technical pictures of when you can say it's gonna, this is going to happen, it's bottoming the, or, or, or it's peaking right now, short term. I don't have a clear short term view. I think we could have a bit more pressure because of the strong dollar. Next year, I think gold will continue to go up next year I, to give 
specific targets for a specific time period is totally meaningless in my I view. Agree. Gold will continue to reflect the problems that we have discussed. Gold will be a lot higher against paper currencies. Uh, and I think 2017, I, I, I think we could even see strong gold and strong dollar initially. So the dollar will probably be strong for a little bit longer, um, whether it's you know a bit into 2017 or not. Eventually, d the dollar is a rubbish currency like all the other, other currencies. It's just relatively, because of technical factors and flow, it's now a bit stronger. Uh, but that will also reverse. But, it, but I think initially we'll probably see a gold and dollar going up uh, at the same time uh, in 2017, which will mean for other currencies, gold will go up even faster of course yeah. if we have a strong dollar and strong gold it means that against other currencies you know it'll be even bigger appreciation and you see in a country which has problems like the uk with the currency etc it we're up we were up 50 percent this year now we're up 37 percent in gold yeah. in, in in pounds gold in pounds that's what happens so this is going to happen to country after country so you know measuring gold do, uh, gold in dollars is also very dangerous because that's just one currency so yes it hasn't done so well in dollars in the short term but in a lot of other currencies like the, the euro like the australian dollar like the canadian dollar we're not that far from the 2011 highs yeah that's a great point so therefore you know you might everyone must just look at gold in their currency and in most currencies except for against the dollar gold Gold is doing very well. It's just that we have a temporarily strong dollar that affects uh, the gold price. That will, I think, reverse in 2017. Well, Egon, I, I, what do you say we come back in 2017 and, and, and see just what it's done and talk about 2018? It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. I'm glad we got to, go and, uh, to sit and do this. And uh, thanks for coming in. Thanks, uh, Grant. I really enjoy it. And I, I think you've done a great job with Real Vision. So uh, thank you. I, 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 I appreciate that.